Hello, everybody. Welcome again to another edition of Badger Blitz TV. I am senior writer Jay Kokorowski from BadgerBlitz.com, your home for all things Wisconsin athletics, covering everything on the recruiting trail, Wisconsin football, Wisconsin basketball. We deliver it to you on BadgerBlitz.com. And we're doing our second video of the day. I always enjoy doing these. And it's one of my, I'm, I'm really, uh, we're going to do some in just a second. We have Derek Peterson from Hale Virus Varsity on, uh, one of my good friends in this media business. I've met I think it's, you know, 2015, 2016-ish, I believe it is, uh, and whatnot. So we'll get to him in a bit. But Wisconsin and Nebraska, of course, uh, battle for the Freedom Trophy coming up on Saturday. Let's go quick basics on this uh, just uh, as, a, as a frame here. Saturday, November 20th, 2.30 p.m. Central Time. Camp Randall Stadium. Capacity is 80,321. How to watch ABC. How to listen. Badger Sports Network. And, of course, right now the odds, according to the Action Network, Wisconsin's a 10-point favorite, which... For those that don't know, Nebraska has not lost a game by more than nine points in 2021, which makes it quite the intriguing matchup. And to help us dissect everything, we got Derek Peterson on, uh, one of my good friends. Derek, I know I talked to you about, uh, I, I gushed about you just a couple of seconds ago. Obviously, writer at large, I think is the way you put it, uh, the podcast host for Hale Varsity. You do a column each week. And how are you doing, my friend? Good seeing you. It's good to see you too. I'm wonderful. Um, I'm out in Chicago now. That's why I'm just a writer at large for Hale Varsity. And I actually just realized as you were introducing me, I'm new to the Chicago area. So I don't know if this Cubs hat is going to offend anybody in, in Wisconsin. I apologize. <laughs> um, I sort of w was an adopted Cub. My wife's family in Chicago is all Cubs. And then uh, when I when I moved to Chicago, I was like, you have to pick the Cubs. I was like, <laughs> All right. Okay. I don't really watch baseball, but I got I got the hat for my sister in law, and I really like it. So I'm good. It's uh, winter is here, and I'm happy. Excellent. And it's good having you back on. And we've talked, like I said, for for Hale Varsity's podcast in years past. We've we've done a bunch of things. And and looking at Nebraska right now, they're three and seven, one and six in the Big Ten. I mentioned it before. They haven't lost a game by more than ten points this season. Just in in a nutshell, just how frustrating has it been for Scott Frost program to to be so close at times where you're playing close to Oklahoma and Michigan state and Ohio state and Michigan all ranked in the college football playoff. And yet no wins in, you know, in that win column coming to fruition. Yeah. I mean, in, in the span of uh, four weeks, they played three teams that are, that are, that were in the top 10 a week ago. Um, Oklahoma just fell out, but they played Oklahoma close. They played Michigan state close. They played Michigan close. Um, and until the Ohio state game, Every single loss this year, each of their first six losses were all by one possession or less, eight points or less. And then the, the Ohio State game broke that streak, which people were excited about, I guess, because that's the point where they're at. Um, Nebraska lost by nine, so it technically wasn't a one-score game anymore. Um, <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the tail of the tape with them is they've been good enough to be in every game that they've played. Um, but you look at losses to, like, Illinois, um, you lose to Purdue, um, you lose to Minnesota. Now Purdue's not a bad team, and Minnesota is, is a weird team. Um, but like, really, the loss to Illinois, it, it, you 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 look bad in the first week of your season, and then you play Ohio State, and you hold them to twenty six points, and you look good. And it's like, okay, well, this Nebraska team knows how to do stuff on offense. It knows how to, you know, schematically. I've been saying this for for weeks and weeks and weeks, and sort of been a Scott Frost defender a little bit, um, which is weird to be at that place. Um, <laughs> but like I've been saying, like the scheme works. The problem is they play up and down to the level of their competition and their execution is lacking in a lot of areas. Um, and so, you know, I think we'll probably get into the defense a little bit. Their defense has been really good. Agent Martinez, as Wisconsin fans, I'm sure know, um, is, is, is sort of a, a, a tough guy to handle. Um, but you know, that's been Nebraska under Scott Frost is they've been good enough to be in these games and been good enough to, to scare some folks, um, at least for a little bit or make people a little, a little antsy, but not good enough to close the deal. And, and, you know, one of the things I looked at early in the season, they haven't been able to score, uh, when the game is close in the last four minutes, they're just not able to, to sort of get over that last hump. And, and a lot of it is execution. A lot of it is mental mistakes. Um, and I think that's why, you know, four assistant coaches were fired this week. That's why there was a lot of talk about, or last week, excuse me. That's why there was a lot of talk about Scott Frost not returning for 22. Um, it just remains the the little things with them. 
I was like, with you mentioned the four assistants being dismissed, you know, Scott Frost announcing that last week, just who's going to replace them? And just, do you think it's going to light a fire underneath this offense that is already potent where it's averaging over 459 yards per contest, but and though it hasn't gone over, you know, it's not averaging 30 points per game. It's still potent putting up yards. What can, what was the reasoning behind it? And just what can that do for this offense at this point in the year? Well, Frost said the reasoning was he, he, he just need to inject some new ideas um, and, and one of the phrases that he used was we can't keep doing the same things and expect different results, which is a whole different can of worms that we could get into um, for, <laughs> for various reasons. I won't bore anybody with the sort of minutiae about Nebraska. But like, um, I, I think the only name that maybe people that aren't crazy familiar with the Nebraska program will recognize is Ron Brown. He's going to be handling running backs. Everybody that is, that is now filling in spots as, as, as offensive assistants they were analysts or, or helpers on Frost staff before they weren't full-time assistants. It doesn't sound like any of them are going to um, – well, how should I say that? It doesn't sound like any of them are favorites to, to get a full-time job after this. And so, you know, you ask, like, what kind of effect does that have on Nebraska's offense? That's really my biggest question with this Wisconsin game is, you know – we generally know what Wisconsin wants to do offensively when it has the ball. We generally know that Nebraska has got a pretty good defense. And so that when, when Wisconsin has the ball, it's going to be a lot of strength on strength. Um, the big question coming in was when Nebraska has the ball offensively, what does it look like against what I think and what the numbers bear out is the best defense in college football. Um, now you add in the, the element of, well, Adrian Martinez just lost a, the guy that recruited him and the guy that has coached him for the last four years, the guy he's really close to. The same thing happened in the running back room. The running backs lost their coach. The wide receivers lost their coach. The offensive line lost their coach. The only guys that still have their guy are the guys in the tight end room. And so, you know, you, you make a change in season and, and you sort of wonder, okay, if, if there was a bad culture, a bad vibe around the locker room, around meeting rooms and things like that, usually when a coach goes, there's like a boon immediately after. I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case because I think most of these players, they were all really close with their position coaches. Uh, they really liked their position coaches. And, you know, as, as I've said, schematically, the stuff that they have done has worked to a degree. It just hasn't produced points because they get into the red zone where you have to execute and it's short circuits where they were early in the season afraid to throw the ball in the red zone. Um, and so what has happened with Nebraska a ton is they've been able to move the ball down the field and then they get into the red zone and things tighten up and windows shrink and all of a sudden it's, okay, well, shoot, we have to kick a field goal. But wait, we don't have a good field goal kicker. Um, so like with them, what, what, I guess what's, what's going to be the, the mood for them when they open the game against Wisconsin? For Nebraska's first possession on offense – if they go three and out, what happens to their to their mentality? What happens to the tone? What does it look like to start? That's the thing that I'm most curious about because, like, you know, what's going to happen on the other side of the ball? You can you can not easily because nothing is ever easy to predict in college football, but you can kind of sense where where it's going to go. But offensively, when Nebraska has the ball, what's it going to be able to do against? Wisconsin's defense and how much of, of this is, is going to be new for some of these guys in new positions with new people talking to them. I'm just, that's the thing that's, that's the most interesting to me. It's always interesting when you make a coaching change mid season. Um, and you know, Nebraska is going to have to figure it out. Now, fortunately they had a bye week and they did it early in the bye week to sort of iron out some things. Um, but, but I am really curious, like if Wisconsin's defense punches them off the field on the first possession pretty quickly, what what happens from then on out? Right, and that's where you know taking a look at like real quick. And I mentioned a couple of the stats for for Nebraska's offense. You know, twenty eight point six points per game, one hundred ninety four point four yards rushing uh, per contest. You know that they haven't had over one hundred and forty since I think that four hundred and twenty seven yard effort against Northwestern about four weeks ago. Passing yards almost two hundred sixty five per contest. They're converting almost nearly forty one percent of their third downs. They have allowed 27 sacks this season, almost three per game. Wisconsin comes in with 30, so three per contest, and they have coughed up the ball 14 times, eight interceptions, six fumbles lost. I guess with this offense then, looking at that, 
uh, maybe he's looking at Adrian Martinez. Where is he? he? You know, we talked about just what he can do against Wisconsin. He had 384 yards passing as a freshman in 2018. In 2019, he had 220 yards through the air, had another 89. If it wasn't for the sack yardage, he would have had over 100, I think 130 yards on nearly eight yards per per attempt. Uh, where have you seen him evolve this year? But where has, has he in the offense, you mentioned the red zone, but where has maybe he still struggled in? Yeah, so the numbers as, as you're listing them out, like it, it reads to me as, as somebody that has seen the, the running back room up close and the offensive line up close. Everything that they do is Adrian Martinez centric. Everything that they get is from Adrian Martinez because you talk about the rushing numbers, the running back room is a mess right now. Um, the starter is hurt. He's banged up. They lost a guy to the transfer portal this week. There's another guy that that I think should be getting used more that hasn't been and is probably leaving the program. Um, they're, they're, it's just a, it's just been a mess. And you talk about the sacks. Um, they've had a really really tough time protecting Adrian, and that goes sort of across the board. Um, really, Cam Jurgens has been the only one that's had a, a serviceable a passable year their tackles have really struggled but they're they're young and they're going against really good big 10 edge rushers but they've still struggled um everything is is just all it's all on adrian's shoulders it's all to move the ball down the field to score it's all got to be adrian doing great things and at times this season you've seen adrian do great things and there was a stat that the that pick six previews tweeted this week that nebraska and ohio state are the only two teams in the country that are top 10 in explosive plays offensively and explosive plays limited defensively. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of what it is. Cause Adrian is creating all of those. Um, so like we have seen him be better throwing down the field. We've also seen him miss throwing down the field. Um, we've seen him be better in terms of his decision-making, you know, before I can't remember, I think it was the Minnesota game where they had a ton of, a, a ton of, it was either Minnesota or Purdue where they turned it over a bunch. But before that game, turnovers weren't really an issue for him. Fumbles weren't really an issue for him. Um, and that was like the biggest area improvement for them coming into the season. They wanted him to limit the turnovers. They wanted him to be more protective of the football. And, you know, through the start, he had done those things. It's just, you know, it there is there's so much pressure on him and there's so much offensive burden on his shoulders that sometimes um, it's a little too much and he tries to, you know, he reverts back to what he was doing junior and sophomore year where he's trying to have the 15 point play because he knows they need it. Right. Um, and that's, that's what's gotten him in trouble in his career. And that's what's gotten him in trouble again this season. So it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of the same, which is, which is wild because they have better playmakers at skill positions, um, particularly at wide receiver. And they have been a, a more explosive offense, um, but it, it just remains their their inability to consistently protect him and their inability to, to get anything from the traditional run game with running backs has been a problem once again. Now, looking at the defense for Nebraska, you know, that one again, 20.9 points per contest, 132.5 on the ground. On only They're only allowing 3.7 yards per carry, so under four yards per touch there. They, they have allowed, you know, some yards through the air, 230.6 for Ohio State. That was 405 uh, in the last game in Lincoln a couple of weeks ago. They have given up 38.5% of uh, on third down conversions. Only 17 sacks this year, about 1.7. Uh, they have created 12 turnovers. Ten of those have come through interceptions. Uh, what has led to, in your eyes, Derek, just the ability for – Nebraska to you know play tight and you know they've they allowed what 23 points to was it Nebraska or not to, not to Nebraska but to Oklahoma was it Michigan That's State correct. and then also 26 points to Ohio State this past week and what's led to some of the changes but where are still some areas like I said I've talked about offensive concerns what are some defensive concerns as well yeah so some of the some of the low scoring games so they hold oklahoma to 23 points um that was when spencer rattler was still a quarterback for oklahoma they were still going through some of their stuff it was a good defensive performance from them um but it was also an offensive game plan for nebraska where they wanted to limit possessions so the the numbers were a little deflated because of that michigan state the spartans had 14 yards of offense on 15 plays in the second half they got punched out three and out on all on all five of their second half possessions that was a 
that was one of the best defensive performances in a half that I've seen, and Nebraska still lost the game in overtime. <laughs> um, Michigan game, they hold them under, I think it was 32 points Michigan yep. got, um, and they got late. And then Ohio State, they hold them to 26. Um, Nebraska's defense has, has really been interesting if you look – because like Nebraska's off, it's exactly like Nebraska's offense actually. Because if you look at Nebraska's offense on paper, you're like, "Hey, this is a really good unit." And then you watch them play, and you're like, "What?" <laughs> Nebraska's defense is the opposite. There's not there's not any like number that you point to except for points that says this is an elite defense. And then you watch them play, and yeah, you can throw the ball on them, and and yeah, you'll be able to run the ball on them, and they're not going to generate a ton of sacks. They're not going to generate a ton of tackles for loss. You just can't score on them. It's just tough to score on them. They make it tough. Um, they, you know, it's it, they, and it'll probably be different without JoJo Doman because he's a big piece and, and he's not going to play the last two games of the season as he's having surgery. Um, but I think Eric Chenander, their defensive coordinator, and, and the defensive coaching staff over there, they've done a really good job of just building depth and and building um, sort of a, a style of play and a culture of play on the defensive side of the ball. That's just we're just going to attack the football. And if we got all 11 guys attacking the football, if one guy like misses a tackle or makes a mistake, it's not going to be something that kills us because we've got 10 other guys there. And it sounds simple, but it's really worked for them defensively. And and I think the biggest thing with them is, is just everybody on that side of the ball has just gotten better. The guys have just gotten better in their years under Chenander. Um, and this is one of the most experienced defenses that Nebraska is probably ever going to have just because of the COVID rule. That plays a... a, a a big benefit. That's a big benefit for them. Um, they've got, they had a ton of super seniors returning. Um, they've got a really good cornerback in Cam Taylor Britt. And then I think in their front seven, they've just been sturdy. Um, and so, like I said, yeah, like, you know, the, the numbers aren't going to jump off the page when you look at them on defense, but then when you see them play, um, you see the, the athleticism that they have at the linebacker level. And Ben Stilley has been really good on the defensive line for them. Just consistent, um, you know, consistency is, is the big thing with them is, is they just continue to, to just do things well enough um, that they're just not going to, they're just not going to give up a ton of points. And there's been a couple of issues, a couple of problem spots that they've had in games this year. They were really bad against Illinois. Um, but from that point on, um, you know, they've just, they've just been solid and, you know, it's not, it's not Wisconsin level elite. And, and I wouldn't call them an elite defense, but I still I would call them one of the 25 best defenses in the country, um, just having having seen what I've seen from them. And then two more quick things before I let you go, Derek. In your eyes, what are your keys for Nebraska to, in an attempt to pull off an upset uh, and, a, and a victory in Camp Randall Stadium and, and bring back the Freedom Trophy to Lincoln for the first time ever? Yeah, it's, it's kind of what I talked about when we were on the offensive side of the ball. They've got to start well. Um, everything that's that's working sort of against them. Um, like, I can't say it enough. Wisconsin's defense is awesome. <laughs> um, I really enjoy watching them play defense. <laughs> that that unit is really good. And, you know, you have to bring your A game when you play them. Um, and so I think for Nebraska, when you when you factor in new assistance on, on the offensive side of the ball and you factor in sort of the, the adversity that they've gone through, They've got to be able to start fast. If if their first two possessions are are quick three and out, are quick like you know four or five play possessions, you get punched off the field, and Wisconsin's able to control the ball. Um, Braylon Allen is awesome. If they're able to run him, and I, I would assume that they're going to try to limit Nebraska's offensive possessions and, and try to, to slow the game down. Um, you know, Nebraska has to have a, a quick start offensively, and they have to be able to get something out of their first two possessions. And if you know, if, if it's end of the first quarter, you know, close to the end of the first quarter and Nebraska has nothing on the board, it's, it's going to be a problem. And then finally, game prediction, who you got and, uh, you know, and, and the reason why? Well, I think Wisconsin wins because I think Wisconsin's a better football team. Um, you know, generally this game comes down to running back and defense and Wisconsin has the better running back and Wisconsin has the better defense. Um, I don't have a score for you, so I'm sorry. <laughs> it's but all good. I, I think I think Wisconsin will win. Um, I think Nebraska will keep it close, just because I think, you know, I don't think that this is going to be a game where there's a ton of points. You know, maybe it's like 34-7 or whatever the score was when Wisconsin played Northwestern last week. Maybe it's like that um, if things go sideways in the first quarter. 
I don't necessarily think that'll be the case, but I still think Wisconsin's going to beat Nebraska. Um, I think defensively losing JoJo Doman is going to hurt. And then I think, you know, with, with what Wisconsin has going on, they're, they're just trending in a really good direction right now. And I, I, I made a joke earlier in the week. I was like, Wisconsin in the middle of November is top 15 in the country and they've ripped off a bunch of wins in a row. So this team is freaking inevitable. It's not a good time to play Wisconsin if you're Nebraska. So that's that's kind of what factors into it. I love the Marvel reference. It's amazing, my friend. Um, and real before I let you go, what else can we expect from Hale Varsity coming up this week? Yeah, so uh, Steve and Aaron are going to be in, in Madison. I'll be at the game. I'll be watching the game um, in the stands. But uh, I'll have a column Sunday afternoon. And then obviously the uh, the usual coverage from, from Hale Varsity will, will all take place on HaleVarsity.com. Excellent. Derek, man, it's always great catching up with you. Hopefully I can ca- catch you before the game. Say hi. Say hi to the misses and everything, man. Good seeing you. Uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you for having me. We'll have to coordinate something. Absolutely. And folks, real quick, before we let you go, real quick, as you hear my dog in the background, uh, make sure you guys subscribe to our page. It's free. Uh, click that like button. We're trying to grow this YouTube page. we got a lot more fun things coming uh, along with beat writer Q and A's. We got takeaways for basketball. We just posted with Benjamin Morgel. Uh, we're hoping to get more recruiting videos up, recruiting uh, weekly spotlights. Follow us on Twitter at McNamara rivals at Jay Coco. Uh, like us on Facebook, search back Wisconsin Badgers on Badger Blitz. And of course for Derek, our guest, follow him at Dr. D R P D P E T E Y H V uh, for all great Nebraska coverage. Y'all, enjoy the game tomorrow. Be safe. Be warm. Be well. We'll talk to you later this weekend on Badger Blitz uh, TV.